This is Iftah. In the past months, I have compiled a data set consisting out of 2,368 synths and drum machines from the year 896 to 2024. And in this video, I wanted to talk about why I did it and also go through a Jupyter notebook I did doing some exploratory data analysis using this data set. I would say my main motivation for creating this data set goes beyond my very evident interest in synthesizers and other electronic music instruments. I've noticed that the availability of historical structured data sets on popular repositories such as Kegel, etc. is quite limited. I would even dare to say non-existent. At least I couldn't find any. So the set contains hardware synthesizers, samplers, and drum machines, and it also contains some periphery like uh, synth controllers and sequencers. However, it does not contain Eurorack or Bukla or other modular format modules, since I feel that these are subjects to their own and should be treated separately. I've spent many hours compiling this dataset through a combination of an automated process, manual efforts, and a lot of research. And I really hope to provide a useful resource for researchers and musicians that want to explore trends, patterns, and the history of the synthesizer landscape. It's still a work in progress, and I definitely aim to maintain it and to add entries and also new features. I would also like to thank Marcel Kohl of SynthDB.com for allowing me to use his valuable information as a foundation for this dataset. I'll just go over the attributes quickly. So year would be release year, obviously. Brand would be the brand of the synth, the name of the synth. The device would indicate which kind of device it is, if it's a synth, sampler, drum machine, or whatever. The form factor would indicate the form factor of the device or the synth, if it's a desktop synth or keyboard synth or whatever. Architecture would um, categorize it to analog, digital, hybrid, or miscellaneous. Synthesis would uh, indicate the synth engine that was being used and the synthesis details would detail the engine. Polyphony would uh, indicate the polyphony count, oscillators, the oscillator count, multi-timbral would indicate if it's a multi-timbral synth and how much parts can it play. Keys would be the key number on the keyboard if applicable. MIDI would indicate if the synth support MIDI or not. Memory would indicate if the synth has memory on board. Key type would indicate the kind of keys, if it's keys or pads or whatever. Velocity indicates if the synth response to velocity or not and aftertouch indicates if it supports aftertouch. Produce would uh, be the years during which the synth was in production. Duration would be the duration of the production and fame is a measure of the synth popularity or influence. The first thing I want to look into is releases over the years. As the density plot shows, there's very little activity before the mid-60s, which is expected. If looking into that, we see that the amount of synths in this list, which were released before 1970, is 45, with the earliest synth on the list being from 1896. Afterwards, from the 70s onwards, we can see a notable increase in synthesizer releases, and we can see some clear trends. Yeah, so let's zoom in and look at releases from 1970 onwards. So in the 70s synths became popular because they became central to the sounds of progressive rock and evolving electronic experimentation and we can see the amount of synth releases are increasing. The 80s were obviously the golden age of synth pop which contributed to a serious boost in their releases as they became essential to pop music. In the 90s we can see some decline due to the rise of guitar driven music as alternative rock and grunge dominated the 90s and the releases declined. In the late 90s we see a revival which I attribute to the digital evolution and the rising or renewed interest in electronic music and this trend goes up until the early 2000s and then we see a certain decline which I think is related to the introduction of powerful software instruments, which then led to decline in demand or development for hardware synthesizers. The 2010s are by far the most fruitful in terms of uh, synth releases. It marked a renewed interest in hardware synthesizers, driven by the mainstream rise of electronic music and uh, revival of analog gear among musicians, as everything became much more affordable, and I refer to it as the democratization of hardware synths. So this bubble exploded pretty quickly in the 2020s with the global pandemic and significant supply chain disruptions affecting availability and development.
So next, uh, I wanted to look at counts by architecture. The architecture attribute categorize hardware entries to analog, digital, hybrid, or miscellaneous. First of all, most of the entries are digital or analog. Notably, there's like 35% more digital releases than analog releases, which obviously made me want to look at digital versus analog. Examining the trend of analog versus digital synths uh, over time, we see that until the mid 80s, analog synths dominated the market simply because digital synths were not available yet. Uh, but from the mid 80s to the mid 2000s, digital synths exploded and took the lead. Peaking in 93, which is a year which to my knowledge uh, had no analog synth releases. However, starting in the 2010s, analog synths made a pretty big comeback and we can see a more equal distribution between the two types. So to sum it up, between 1990 and 2005, 86% of the synths released were digital while only 14% were analog. The earliest digital synth on the list is the Coupland Digital Synthesizer by Micor, although it's worth noting that it was never officially released. So, to my knowledge, the first commercially available synth was the Synclavier, which was released in 1977. Next, I wanted to look at the duration of uh, synths produced by filtering the data frame to show the five largest duration values. The first one on the list with a pretty insane production run of 60 years from 1928 to 1988 is I hope I'm pronouncing it right. To be fair, only 60 units were made, but nonetheless, it made its way to a lot of movie soundtracks and even got some recent appearances, notably featuring Johnny Greenwood of Radiohead using it on stage. However, as exotic as it might be, I find the next entry to be quite surprising. The Alessis SR16 drum machine, which was first released in 1990, and it's still being produced to this day. To my knowledge, it's the oldest widely commercially available instrument that you can still buy new. According to my readings online, Alessis even claims it's one of the best-selling drum machines, which makes sense given the fact that uh, it's being produced for so long. So, looking into the count of synths still in production, we currently have 463 entries. Among these synths, we see the SR16 that we just talked about, the Microcorg, which is also being produced since 22 years, and the Vermona Performer MK2, which uh, is around since 14 years. So then I wanted to explore the average production years of synths over time. What I did is I filtered the data frame to focus on synths made between the 1970s and the 2010s, allowing me to calculate the average duration of each year. And to make it a little bit more accurate, I used some time waiting, and this approach involves calculating average duration based on the age of each synth, effectively giving more weight to synths that have been around longer. The reason I'm doing this is that older synths are likely to have longer shelf lives compared to new models which haven't been on the market that long. So yeah, we need to account for that. I went with polynomial regression because I've noticed that the relationship between the production years of synths and the average duration is not linear. I used this model to predict the average duration for 2020 to check if the model was performing as expected. And as shown in the graph below, the prediction was fairly accurate. And based on this analysis, I made a prediction that the average shelf life of a synth in 2027 would be six years. And I guess we will have to find out if I'm right. And the next thing I wanted to look into was top brands by releases. Uh, by that I mean which brands released the most synths. Looking into top brands by releases, we see that Roland, Korg and Yamaha lead the list, which is not surprising. I guess it's expected given their strong presence in the music industry. All three brands are known for making very, very famous synths, yeah. Uh, afterwards, we see companies such as Emu, uh, Kurzweil, Klavia, Moog, Akai, and Sonic, and Oberheim. But the difference between the amount of releases is pretty noticeable between the top three and the rest. So next up, I wanted to look at polyphony. And if we look at the top 10 polyphony counts, we see a very clear trend. There are significantly more monophonic synths being released. Among the polyphonic designs, we can see that 8 Voices is particularly popular, and then there's like a variety of even-numbered polyphony combinations. Interestingly, odd-number polyphonic synths seems to be less popular. I guess this could uh, also be related to the fact that even-numbered configurations have some advantages when it comes to simpler circuit design, poor 
distribution, even stereo distribution. If you look at the highest polyphony counts, the ANS synth is the top of the list, and it was designed by a Russian engineer named Yevgeny Mutsin, and it was a pretty interesting synth generating sound using like a drone spectrograms on a glass disc. It offered a very impressive range of 720 microtones, so it had 720 notes polyphony across 10 octaves, which is pretty insane. Afterwards, we see primarily modern entries from the 2000s and onwards. If you look at polyphony over the years, and we look at average polyphony distribution, uh, we see an interesting pattern. It peaks in the late 90s and early 2000s, and I think that uh, during this time, polyphony count was really important and also used for multi-timberality, and it was pretty essential for pre-computer productions. Notably, later on, there was a decline in average polyphony around the mid-2000s, even as the releases peak, and I think that the the reason behind it is the insane popularity of monophonic analog scenes during that uh, time. So as I mentioned before, multi-timberality had a peak uh, between the 90s and the 2000s. During this period, multi-timbral synths became very popular because they offered a comprehensive solution for producers. However, this trend began to decline. Uh, the rise of uh, digital audio workstations provided producers with way bigger flexibility. So as I mentioned before, I discovered that in 1993, zero analog synths were released, which made it the most polyphonic and digital year in the synth history that I'm aware of, at least. Some significant models I would name is the Waldorf Wave and the EMU Morpheus. So after this, I also wanted to explore the year with the highest percentage of analog and monophonic synths which turned out to be 1974, with 100% of the releases being analog and 62.5% of the releases being monophonic. And some notable synths you probably heard of are the Oberheim SEM and the Roland System 100M. So the next thing I want to look into was synth names and explore how are they being named and if I can see any patterns. So this piece of code basically count the words and create a trim up of the 30 most popular words on the list. Uh, if we ignore Nord, <laughs> which is uh, linked to the 63 Clavia instrument entries on the dataset, I've noticed a very frequent appearance of 2 or Roman 2, uh, which made me wonder how many synths had a sequel. So I filtered the dataset to show entries containing 2 or MK, and this uh, returned 192 entries, which made me conclude that 8.1% of the synths in the dataset have a sequel. Next, I want to talk about fame. Fame is a parameter I've developed using a formula that assesses the popularity of a synth by combining several factors. The score is calculated based on the presence of official websites, social media links, or music-related sites, for example, uh, with specific points given for uh, each identified link, basically. Additionally, the score considers the number of search results in search engines and also incorporates the similarity score obtained uh, from the Wikipedia API, reflecting how often a synth is being mentioned or referenced in Wikipedia. It also takes into account the presence of news articles uh, and reviews. So what I try to do is uh, by combining these factors is to quantify the online presence uh, and relevance of each synth. Looking into the top 10, we can immediately see that the highest fame score is dominated by analog synths from the 70s and the 80s, not surprising, with the TR-808 drum machine topping the list. This is followed by the original Minimoog and then the TB-303. Yeah, if you've been to the music technology scene for a while, you might feel that this top 10 list is self-explanatory and you might ask yourself, uh, why, why do I need data science for this? However, uh, one of the most beautiful things about data science for me is the capacity to validate existing knowledge while also revealing new patterns. So, I, yeah, I mean, if you would have asked me if the, what are the most famous or fame or talked about since, I would probably get this list 70-80% right out of the top of my head, but still, for me, it means that my scoring is pretty accurate because I consider myself 
to have some kind of domain expertise. If we break fame into architecture types, we see that analog is being led by the TR-808, as we just mentioned. Digital is being led by the DX7. The wonderful Oscar, which is also one of my favorite vintage synths, leading the hybrid section. And the miscellaneous is led by the very quirky Roland MC300 sequencer. Looking into fame versus actual sales, I first want to mention that fame should not be confused with popularity in terms of sales. In fact, I would probably argue that since released in smaller quantities and that are harder to get, often obtain more of a cult status, actually. So to illustrate this point, I've compiled a small data frame that includes some known sales figures for 35 cents. Among these entries, we can see the code Triton, the original one from 1999, which is, to my knowledge, the best-selling synth of all time. So if we examine the plot below, we see a distinct pattern that uh, emerge regarding the sales performance of synths from a contemporary perspective. The three best-selling models are the Korg Triton, the Korg M1, and the Roland D50. They were released in the 80s and 90s, and all occupy the medium fame range, interestingly. It suggests that the synths achieved very high commercial success without necessarily being regarded as groundbreaking. I mean, they were groundbreaking for very pragmatic reasons. Maybe with an exception of the D50, which was quite innovative, did gain some recognition in modern times. I attribute the success of the Triton and the M1 to the world's very reliable workstation with tons of polyphony, tons of sound sources, and the ability to produce complete tracks. Interestingly, the Yamaha DX7 is standing out as a possible exception. It is very high regarded and it is the fourth best-selling synth in history according to my list. So if we look at synths with very high fame score, we see that synths such as Minimoog and the Korg MS20 and the Roland SH101 and the Juno 106, they all sold fewer than 50,000 units. Notably the Minimoog, which is the most popular among these, sold only 13,000. I mean, if it's limited production combined with the unique characteristics, probably contributed to their fame status. So this concludes this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'm leaving links to the notebook and the data sets down below. I would also like to mention that I would love if people would join me and help me expand this data set. Uh, so feel free. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.